welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks the yoke. Without the Holy Spirit and its power, we can't do our work. Father, we're one of many churches that get the privilege to preach the gospel on a Sunday night. We consider it an honor and a privilege for your presence to show up on campus and do what only you can do. It's an amazing work of God here at the Rock Church because you're at work working the rock and making it happen. Thank you for all those that are coming out tonight. I thank you for those that are diligently seeking after him and preaching the gospel tirelessly. There will be a day where we stop and the Spirit of God will say enough and Jesus will come and rescue his church. But until that day, we'll continue to preach day in and day out. These pulpits will be open to deliver the great word of restoration and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. You know, as Pastor Dan asked me to come, you know, I, I've just been honored to sit under some amazing pastors like Pastor Jim and Deborah, some of the pastors of The Rock that were able to deliver uh, great messages on marriage. And I consider it an honor and a privilege. We do not take this lightly, this position and this place. Um, But I'm telling you, and this is not a pitch, I'm not going to do a shame deal, but when we do um, spiritual guidance here at The Rock for many, many marriages that come into this house, we offer them a set of CDs by Pastor Jim and Deborah. They, they did an amazing job uh, for weeks on end to give uh, the heartbeat of what marriage, is, what marriage is and what marriage isn't. We're only scratching the surface. If you've attended Sunday nights, there's much more about this. I would highly consider that you would purchase a, a copy of this message and these sets of messages and listen to them over and over and over because our God is using our senior pastors to rescue and heal marriages and this needs to be in your library and I want to give it away. Antonio, can you help me? Who wants, who wants it? Can, is, that, is that okay? All right. Uh, right there, that man in the black hat. The black hat. All right. All right. That's all I'm going to give away so I'm going to give nothing else. <laughs> the word of God. <clears throat> You know, today we have a message called Hope. It's on the heels of an amazing message that you heard this morning about compassion. Pastor Jim, the Holy Spirit wore you today. I mean, all over him. And that heartbeat message is on the heels of what we're going to deliver tonight called Hope. Hope is a message that you need to hear. Without it, you will fail. If you don't have hope inside of you, you're going to walk out of these doors and and be pillaged by the enemy, and you're going to lose hope, and you're going to lose faith, and you're going to walk out of here faithless. Hope is not going to be cast to you. Hope is going to be given to you by the Spirit of God and through the Word of God, and you need to catch it, own it, possess it, and keep it, because it is the hope, and we're going to define what hope is, that's going to keep you alive in good times and bad times in a relationship and outside a relationship. Our conversation tonight is just not going to be a conversation on marriage. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a conversation if you've had a failed marriage. It's going to be a conversation if you want to get married and you're scared to get married. It's going to be a conversation that why do this again because there's hope. It's going to be a conversation if you're single and you want to get married, there's hope for you. I met a guy at New Visitors Lounge just today, and he said, honest, Pastor, I'm here looking for a wife. And I said, okay, I guess, you know, I mean, he goes, I'm just being honest. And this is what The Rock is about. I mean, this is where we're at. You know, uh, like Pastor Dan said, you know, we are in charge of the restoration here at The Rock called Breaking Free. I need to share something with you, and this is what the Spirit of God told me to say. You know, Breaking Free was a seed when it came here about nine years ago. But it needed soil. It needed a theology. It needed protection. It needed a house. 
Breaking free found a house and possessed by soil, and it grew an amazing restoration under this covering, under these pastors, at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Without this church, breaking free would not exist. It's a God idea. It's a restoration idea. That's why it works. So within nine years, we've been micromanaging what breaking free is because I didn't know, Joanna didn't know, no one knew what it was. It's the heartbeat of God to rescue the broken, the limping, the maimed, the rejected, the rejects that nobody wants. There's a big net of salvation and restoration here at the rock and it's being cast weekly to rescue those who need help. Breaking Free Theology was formed here at The Rock. The understanding and the roots of restoration were by The Rock and for The Rock's purpose. Our story is our story, but I'm telling you, it's a rock story. When we look at the Bible, let's turn to your Bible, and it says this. We're going to talk about hope. Hebrews chapter 1, 11, verse 1. Very familiar scripture. What I'm going to talk about today is not the wishy-washy, maybe, somehow optimistic idea of hope. I'm not going to talk about that kind of hope. I'm going to talk about the biblical hope. The world has a wishy, well, maybe, hopefully, uh, I don't know, I hope so. That's a ridiculous hope. What I'm talking about is a biblical hope that brings a confident expectation of the supernatural in God, in him, in us, bringing to light what is not there. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, I mean 11 verse 1, now by faith the assurance hope for and the convictions not seen. Hope brings a manifestation of something that was never not an invention in my own head, an invention in the idea of the heart of God. And if we actually have a biblical hope, we have a confidence that's a supernatural confidence. It takes something out of nothing and something that is broken and mends and it has an expectation of hope and in Jesus to make it right. Where there is wrong, God makes it right. Where there is crookedness, he makes it straight. Where there is nothing, something exists. That's our beautiful story of restoration. When we gave up hope, when we had no more hope, when we were there as losers in the context of a church, we cast our heart to heaven and we cast our cares to the Lord and he rescued us with this great word called hope. He gave us some supernatural confidence that only God can give us. Not the wisdom of man, not the wisdom of counselors of the many. Do you know this world wants to counsel you to ab nauseum? <laughs> At three o'clock, turn on every channel, and Oprah included. The world's wisdom does not work. Their expectation of hope does not work. How do I know that? Look at their marriages. Are they working? They're not. But somehow we got sold that hope is this maybe, hopefully, just be positive, brother. It's deeper than that. And it had to be deeper than that for us. If it wasn't deeper than that, we would not have had a God encounter. If it was deeper than that, our heart would not have changed. If it was not deeper than that, we would have still been going the wrong way quickly. Have you ever been there? Going now, I mean, not just a little bit, uh, uh, you're off a lot. The Lord gave us a supernatural expectation of hope. And with that ex ex uh, ex this world's hope, this expectation of hope, sorry, casting a vision of hope is what you need. You need it for your marriage. You need it for yourself. You need it if you're single. You need it, if you need it to be married again. This expectation of hope is a reality that exists in this place. You wouldn't be sitting in this seat if there was no hope. There was birthing in the Spirit of God long ago, 25 years ago, the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. You're sitting in hope, living, breathing hope, and that's why this church exists. That's why we exist as pastors. But our story took a really wicked turn for the worst. 
when we were losing in every area, when we were bankrupt in every way possible, when we, I mean, we've been married 25 years. I've been married 25 years to my beautiful bride, Joanna. <laughs> Let me just say, I say this story all the time, and people get a kick out of it. We were a mess. I mean, we were jacked up. We were a mess. And I remember one time, yeah, oh, she's pointing at me. Huh? I was a mess. Okay. <laughs> I had some anger issues, and I remember... For whatever reason, I got mad at Joanna, and at that time, a young man, I'd break things. Why? I don't know. Still don't know. I don't break things anymore. Thank God I'm healed. But at that time, I thought it was a great idea to break, you know, the, uh, the remote control in front of her. I'm going to get mad at you. Oh, Joanna. And I went, bang. Take that. The Incredible Hulk. Look, ah. Yeah, and she looks at me, and she says, you're loony. I mean, you're weird. <laughs> Literally walked away. Well, I, I thought it was a bright idea at the time until I had to change the channel. <laughs> now, this was the day before Universal Remotes existed. It was the only remote that existed. If you broke it, you're done. So what was I doing for months on end was taking off my shoe with my big toe, changing the channel. She walked by me one day and she looked at me and she says, oh my God, you're really dumb, and walked away. <laughs> so my remote control was my big toe. Now why do we say this to you? Because I'm telling you, we're not perfect. There's only one that it is and that's Jesus Christ and he made us what we are. <laughs> we ended up adopting three kids and three kids turned into five kids. And the Lord did a major work of healing and restoration in our heart. We continued this journey of hope until the Lord showed up strong and gave us a, a quickening in our spirit and hope and confidence that we never had. I didn't sit down with a pastor. I sat down with God. And I heard for the very first time, there is hope in you. There is hope. I give you hope. I'm going to help you to manage it and use it well. And you're going to be able to use hope for the many. And that story and that journey progressed. And my wife is going to come up and share her piece of this story. Even though we're briefly explaining it, Joanna is going to come up and share hope. Yes. Second part, Joanna. <laughs> Praise God. So the second point is hope given. So like Joelle says, we were a mess. And um, Pastor Jim gave me the green light to be honest. <laughs> but not too honest, no, I was kidding. <laughs> but anyway, so 12 years into our marriage, th four kids later, you know, we first were married, and like the dance, it was beautiful, all happy and cheerful. But life happens. Amen? Life happens, you know. So I found myself 12 years into my marriage looking at my husband and saying, who did I marry? I must have missed the boat. I must have married the wrong guy. I mean, he, what happened to Trudy be wonderful and, you know, being amazing? And, you know, after 12 years, marriage could get a little boring. And I even found myself when I looked at him and searching my heart. And I remember going through that time, um, finding out my, that my sister-in-law had lupus and that she was dying, and she was the same age as me. And we had small, both of us had small babies and little children, and I, you know, and I really started searching my heart and saying, oh my God, life is short. You know, and here I am in a marriage, and I'm hating it. And, and I found myself very unhappy, and, and I, I even looked at him, and I didn't, even, I didn't even feel any love for him anymore. I was at that place where I didn't feel any love. And I, and I was just like, God, where did it go? What happened? Here I was at that time. We weren't here at this church. We were at a church in Riverside, and I was the children's church director at that time. My husband was on the board. He ministered on the pulpit. I ministered to the children. And yet I found myself hating my husband, just wondering what, what went wrong, what went wrong. And I just remember 
saying, God, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I know that, you know, we don't believe in divorce, and you say that, you know, no, and, you know, but I don't want to continue in this marriage this way. You know, so I was at that place, and I was crying out to God, and I was angry at Joelle, and, and you know, I was a man-hater. You know, you, I, you know for, I just blamed everybody. I hate all men, you know. <laughs> and I said, God, I need some answers. Show me one good man. Show me. Everywhere I looked, I, was, I felt like I was, you know, I was judging Ben wrongly. I was offended. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, look at my son, Jesus. And it just dropped in my heart. And I said, oh, God, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Look at my son, Jesus. Because of Jesus... There is hope for your husband. Because of Jesus, there is hope for your marriage. And oh my God, it just, I just, it just dropped. And I want you to, to turn to Psalms. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. <clears throat> Psalms, verse, chapter 31, verse 24. Amen. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. And that's exactly what Jesus did. I was weary, I was tired, I, had, I felt like this was it. I was ready to call my marriage quits. I didn't care if, if it was against God's word anymore. I was just like, God. Show me. Let me out. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, because of Jesus, there is hope. Don't give up. And I said, okay, Lord, I won't give up. Because of Jesus, there is hope. And that dropped in my spirit. And I started just, you know, praying for my husband. I started working through this unforgiveness. You know, the, all these walls built up. I was really good at keeping offenses. I had a whole pocket full, and every time we get in a fight, I bring out the offenses and the list of all what I thought he did wrong. But what I found out, that it wasn't about Joelle, it was about my own heart, and my own judgments, and how I judged him wrongly, and how I let bitterness grow in my heart, and I let those walls stack up, and before you know it, I was in this prison of unforgiveness. And I had to choose to forgive and release and walk it out by faith. Sometimes, did I feel like doing it sometimes? No. No, I didn't. But I did it because of Jesus. Because he gave me hope. And he gave me the promise that my marriage would be healed. And it would be restored. And let's turn to, in the Message Bible, you don't have it, but I wrote it down, and you could look on the overhead, the screens, but in Ephesians chapter 1, it says this, and this is a word that the Lord gave me too, because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by our misdeeds, and not barely free either, abundantly free. Because of Jesus, because the blood on the cross, he redeemed us. He paid the price so that I could have a good marriage, not a perfect marriage, because there is no perfect marriage, but that I could find love and forgiveness because Jesus forgave me first. I could find it in my heart to forgive also. And that's exactly what I did, and praise the Lord, 25 years later, five kids later, I'm, st I'm in love with that man, more than I ever have been, ever. <laughs> I love him more today than I did the first day I married. And it's a deep love. It's an unconditional love. It's a God's love. So don't give up. Hope is given through Jesus Christ. Thank you. You know, I, I remember one time Pastor Jim walked into my office and says, did you want to still love you? 
<laughs> and I said, um, yeah, she's more in love with me today than ever before. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you remember this, Pastor. She changed my life as well, as well as Jesus Christ. A good marriage, somebody said, takes time. A better marriage takes more time. It's hard work. But in the Lord, in hope, this, world, this woman of God, who, if Pastor Deborah's the Jeremiah or the prophet's sister, I guess that's what Pastor Jim says, or Isaiah the prophet, Joanna is John the Beloved's niece. <laughs> this, this woman has so much love. It actually caused restoration and healing in me. So when hope was given from on high, it was given from another individual. We say all healing begins in relationship, relationship to God and relationship with each other. That's why the context of marriage is a mystery, Paul calls, and that's why making a relationship works is a supernatural event. Now, this church is built on grace, and we cast out that line of grace if it didn't work for you. But just because it didn't work for you doesn't mean it's not a God idea and an idea that works. It will work if you depend on him. When hope was given, hope was also promised. The promise of hope is found in the book of Psalms, verses 34, verses 17. When the righteous cry out for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of trouble. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those of crushed spirit. That was me. That's you. That's us. This supernatural divine hope comes and looks for the maimed, the limping, the backwards, the ones that didn't make it, and breathes hope where there is no hope. Puts a natural on the supernatural, and all of a sudden, hope's promise exists. When we were at our wit's end, we looked up, and we found Jesus. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was so broken, and I didn't go to church for an answer, and I didn't go to a psychologist, and I didn't go to therapy. I sat down in a cave here in Devor. Some brother in the Lord etched out in rock a prayer mountain. And I stuck myself in there for three days. Not because I was spiritual, because I didn't know what to do. Not that we were walking in the supernatural. As a matter of fact, we were losing everything. I walked in there and I shut the door and I pounded it out with the Holy Spirit. I asked for answers. I said, where are you? And he took me to a set of uh, uh, seasons of my life, and he showed me some events. And God was etching out and mapping out a plan for me. Amen. I didn't know what he was doing. All I know is when I broke from that, I had a God encounter that changed my life. And that God encounter, a spirit of restoration and hope dropped in me. I got off that mountain. I called my wife, and I said, there is hope. And she said, what are you talking about? I hate you right now. I said, I know, but there's hope. <laughs> hope is given, but hope demands someone to receive it. Amen. If you're not ready to take it, you won't possess it. It's like Pastor Jim said, you can hear and hear and hear, but if it doesn't drop in the heart, it's not going to go nowhere. Hope exists. Right there we see in Jeremiah 30. Read, turn there for me. Jeremiah 30, verse 17. They have it up on the overhead. Look at this promise. I will restore your health to you, and I will give healing to your wounds. Because they've called the outcast and saying, this is Zion. No one seeks after for those, no one who cares for. In other words, the Lord is a seeker for those that have nothing but Jesus. I'm looking, not for tips of success, not for things and modification, behavior modification to make your light, your heart brighter. A radical, 
commitment to change from the inside out where there is now a supernatural love where there isn't a supernatural deposit of spirit of God in you where you were dead in your sins and your trespasses and God wakes you up and says oh my God I now have a light a new lease in life and I'm ready to do life and I'm ready to conquer and win This is much more than a motivational speech. This is a motivation of God possessing you. And when God possesses you, watch out. We open up to the book of Acts chapter 9. There is Paul riding on his horse, horse ready to kill more Christians. And what happened? He had a God encounter. He got thumped on the head by the Holy Spirit. He woke up blind and he said, I don't know what happened, but something supernatural happened. If you're ready for that God encounter, God is ready to meet you. If you're ready just to modify your behavior, it doesn't work. If you're ready just for two, three tips for success, it will never work. The reason why it works is because we have in the one faith in the one who does actually care for us. And that's Jesus Christ. He has our best interest. He has our only interest. He's the one that you can hope in. We have great pastors here at The Rock, no doubt. All of us have amazing stories, but we're not God. We will continue to push you to Jesus. We will continue to motivate you to Jesus. We will continue to have to tell you, have a God encounter, man, it works. We will continue to ask you to seek, knock, and fast, and look for God, and you will find him. That's the story of restoration and hope. Happens all over the Bible. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 40 says this. I mean, the first chapter is the face chapter and everybody's all okay, man. Look at faith and power. Look what they did. It drops down to this verse and this verse is very interesting to me and that's why I put it up here. It's A voice of hope. If we read it, God is providing something better for us. You know, the devil has a plan, but God has a better plan. You might think that you're a walking accident and you have made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. Those labels the enemy tries to give you, but God gives you now something better. It's always better. It might taste a little tough to take down, but it's better. It's like good medicine. You know, we give it to your children, take this. No, I don't like it because it's awful. But it makes them feel better. This is the tough medicine. Why? Because if you look at the following verses right up above this, the tough medicine was these guys died in faith. They died with the promise. They died with the hope for tomorrow. They died that there's something better. There's something worth it. There's something more. And I'm going to buy into this thing called kingdom faith because God has something better for us. And he has something better for you. He had something better for us. The hope and promise is fulfilled in the book of Job. I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but throw the scriptures up there where God restores his fortune. We look at the first book of Job and everything dies, including all his animals and all his children. And his wife looks at him and says, curse God and die. What a faith statement. And then we read the end of Job and he gives us a beautiful promise. And this promise of hope and restoration is found. He said, verse 10, the Lord restored his fortunes and increased twofold, double for his trouble. The Lord blessed them in latter days more than the beginning. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and he had 13 sons and three daughters. This man was rich and blessed. And then it says here in verse 16, Then after Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and grandsons, what does it say? Four generations. 
That's why hope is worth it. Why is hope worth it? Because your children's 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 children will be blessed. The seed that you planted now will grow and multiply. Why is it worth your marriage saving? Because your children's children's children will be blessed. Why does the supernatural have to exist? Because that's generational blessing. I am a product of the generational blessing. Pastor Jess and Dan, Luke, part products of the generational blessing. We're not up here just because we have talent. We're up here walking a mom and dad's generational blessing. The seed they sowed years ago is now coming to harvest. And now their kids' kids are now being a blessing to many. That's the way it works. That's what righteousness does in the heart of people. It's just not a good idea. It's a God idea. It's just not something to say, oh, maybe, hopefully, get in it so then your children's children could be blessed. God has a promise for you. Isaiah 58, turn there. God has a promise for you. Back to Isaiah 58, which is a mandate of this church. Heartbeat of breaking free. Isaiah 58, 12. That he will rebuild the deserts of your ruins and you will be known as a rebuilder of the walls and restorer of homes. My God, what a promise that the Lord gave this church and a mandate to rebuild the home from the inside out. It starts with you. Making a change in your heart starts with you making a decision to move forward starts with you there's a first step and we're casting the net of hope to you that you will grab a hold of it so you can take the first step the next step the next step and the next step so you can get healed and your home can get healed and you can walk in supernatural abundant blessing the rock church needs supernatural marriages to be healed so we could be a living testimony to san bernardino that marriage works I was praying for the city this week. I had the honor to pray. And all the city officials were there looking at me. Kind of funny. And one came to introduce herself. The head chair. Her name is Josie. She says, by the way, what's your little church's name? <laughs> little church? It's a little church called the Rock Church World Outreach Center. We have 24,000 members. What? <laughs> we fed half a, half a million people without the help of your board. <laughs> what? Without the help of government assistance or food banks. You know the Rock Church, a World Outreach Center, is a restorer of those that come in to get restored, not only their food and groceries, but homes and lives being changed? She got stopped right in her tracks. She could, did not have an answer for me, you know, because all these politicians have an answer, a well-polished answer. You know, I was not there to explain to her what supernatural things are happening on campus. I was there to be a living testimony of hope, of the righteousness and the restore of those that have come to this amazing place and got healed and restored. And that's the testimony of this house. And that's the testimony of this couple. And that's the testimony of your pastors. And that's the testimony of you. Somehow we over-spiritualize God encounters. And we say that if we're not in the pulpit, it can't happen to us. It can and it will. The Lord revealed to me one day, well, Lord, you know, what's going to happen to my ministry when I was all messed up? Your ministry? Are you kidding me? (laughs) We went to a church of 25. I mean, your ministry, okay. He said this. He said it very clearly. He said, why don't you go back home and get healed and be a pastor to your own wife? Then be a pastor to your children. And out of that pastor's call, I'll maybe allow you to pastor my house. Wow. He pulled it back. He reined me in. 
Because I was gunning for the pulpit at the time. Remember, Juana prayed me out. I was running with these Latino guys. I'm serious. I mean, I was trying to get to the top fast, going nowhere. Deluded. Washington, D.C., we got to meet with President Bush, and I thought I was all that. Where my wife and children are dying at the house. And the Lord said, go back home. You're doing no good business here. Get off your high horse of pride. Go get restored. Fix this. He Let me heal this. And maybe from there, let's start. Years later, years later, the Isaiah promise was this in 58, 14. Then the Lord said, I will be your delight and I will give you great honor and satisfy your inheritance with promise as your ancestors. The big picture, folks, the big picture is just not I went to Sunday night and heard the message. I went to a retreat and we got touched. The big picture is I am now a restorer of the breach and God has called me for some supernatural work and it begins with me and it begins with my house and out of there it goes into the church. I have an honor to have my mother-in-law here tonight and she's been in the faith for years. And way back then she tapped me on the shoulder and says, I have something to tell you. I'm like, okay, now what? <laughs> you have a chip on your shoulder. There's something wrong with you. I got offended with her. Later on in, break, in Breaking Free, I had to write her a letter, but that's besides the point. <laughs> the Lord told me she was on to something. There's something wrong with you. You know, we don't like to look at ourselves, do we? When we open up the word of God and we see it, we go, ah. Oh. oh, my God. Oh, that hurts. Hurts so much we put the Bible down and walk away from it. But the Lord is inviting to you tonight. It's an invitation of hope. It's a supernatural rescuing of yourself. It's a casting your care on him because he's the one that cares. If you have failed in any kind of way, you qualify. Because God is a God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances. He's a God that never gives up on you because he never gives up on us. I'll end with this story. I didn't know what story to end with. I'll end with this one. I was riding my 15-year-old daughter home the other day. I mean, not home, to school. And she was just kept on looking at me and looking at me and looking at me. She's in 11th grade. And she's tearing up her high school for Jesus. And I tell her, Janae, what are you looking at? I mean, you know, is it my hair? I mean, you know, I know I don't have any left. <laughs> and I was at the wheel, and she kept on looking at me and kept on looking at me. And she says, no, 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 Dad. She says, you're an amazing, powerful man of God. And you're my hero. And I want to marry someone like you. If I never had a pulpit, never a ministry, if I never had another chance to get up here or anywhere else, I'm winning at my house. Amen. I'm winning. I'm more in love with Joanna than ever before. Me and her are hand-in-hand -hand team taking this church and the people in this church and caring for them. We have heard the most horrific, horrendous stories that exist here at The Rock. And in every story that we read, in every letter that is written, in every person that comes to this process, we see one word jump out at us over and over and over and over again, and that's there's hope. There's hope for you, there's hope for me, there's hope for us, and there's hope for San Bernardino. And the Bible says that if we trust in the Lord with all our might, he now will do it. We've been saying this over and over again. 
How does this work? You've got to speak it. You've got to wake up every morning and say, man, I hate this life, but I know in Jesus' name I can make it work. I can make it work. Why? Because the Bible says it will work. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going. What I touch, I will prosper. Whether you feel like it or not. What changed our relationship was the prayer of my wife saying, my God, I don't know how to reach him, but you do. So reach him. Praying of the saints. We have to speak it. We have to accept it. Grab a hold of it. Let it sink in your heart to do something about it. The compassion that this church has will only go as far as you. You have to be the compassion agents. You have to be the walking billboards. You have to be the evangelist. You have to one to have the hope in the promise to give the promise. If you don't have it, you can't give it. If you don't possess it you, and you don't own it, you're not going to give it to nobody. Well, Pastor, my marriage is a mess. Well, get into God. Let's see what he does with it. Ask the Holy Spirit. Let's see what he tells you. He's a great and mighty counselor. He will show you and teach you if you let him. Problem is, is our reluctancy to do that. Because he might show us things that we don't want to see or do. Most often than not, people know how to read the Bible. It's they don't know how to let it drop in their spirit because they're resisting the spirit of God to change them. And resisting the spirit of God to say it doesn't work this way. It works that way. It's not your idea. It's God's idea. It's not about you. It's about me. It's not about your husband or your children. It's about the kingdom of God. And the more you get into that idea, the more your life starts to change. So he said, so Pastor Jim and Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke have been saying, speak it, accept it, walk in it. Walk it out. Every day is a faith walk. Every day is another promise. Every day is a new day. Every day is a good day. Every day I can make it. And when the enemy tells me I can't, I can take two more, three more steps. Yeah. He gives me the power to do it. Now I'm getting Pentecostal, ain't I? <laughs> Last word there is to take it. Possess your land. Possess it. What's possess mean? Possess, and that's, this is the, the key ingredient to restoration. It's just not making up for lost time. It's taking back what the enemy has stolen and then some. That this was my father's, my grandfather's, and my forefather's, and I'm taking it back. And now this is mine to possess. Here it is, to give it away. What your family's lost, what your grandpa lost, what your mom and dad lost, what your brother and sister lost, God owns. Not the devil. He thinks he does. You take it back. You own it. You possess it. You control it. You take your divine steps of that inheritance that is yours in Christ Jesus and own the property. And what they lost, you make up for. And what they didn't have, you possess. And that's generational. You have the power to do it. But the enemy will tell you, but I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. Great, you're a candidate. <laughs> but I don't have nothing. Great, I could put something in your hand. but I don't qualify. Well, that's good because Jesus is the only one that qualifies. And he qualifies you to qualify. That God of restoration and that God of hope and promise is that God that is here tonight. That God has made a declaration to you where hope is given, point number one. Hope is restored, point number two. And point number three, hope is promised. I want everybody to stand to their feet. I don't know if you're here, Elijah, but yeah, thank you.
The Lord wanted me to pray for this congregation. Supernatural prayer of faith to infuse the hope, one that can give the hope, and one that we live in to hope in, and that's Jesus. You might be here tonight. This is not an altar call. I will do that a little bit later on. You might be here tonight and say, you know, Pastor, I, I really don't know. I'm contemplating divorce right now, and my God, it doesn't look good. Well, there's hope for you. You might say tonight, you don't know what the hell I've lived in. You have no idea of the pain I'm in. You're probably right. I don't. But God does. There's hope for you. You might say, you know what? Why get married again? It didn't work the first or second time. Pastor, it's not going to work the third time. Why should I give it another shot? Because you're trusting in God and not man. And where men hurt you, God won't. And where God can now make up for lost time and give you the family that he promised. I'm convinced people stay single because of their issues with God and men. And if you overcome those things and release and forgive yourself and let God, he will open up a supernatural door of restoration and healing for those that are coming your way to get married to. You might say tonight, you know, I, I don't give myself much hope. Nobody loves me. Every, every relationship I've been in, I've been a train wreck. I am an absolute disaster and mess. I've messed up relationships. I've messed up people. I've messed up my kids. I've messed up. Well, I'm here to tell you, God is a God of second chances, third, fourth, and fifth. You can get healed and restored, and he can put you in the high place and set your spirit straight if you let it. The Bible says, ask those ask 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 of God ask of him and if you ask of him he will set you straight and set you up for blessing I felt it ever since this morning there is a spirit of faith in this place a spirit of mercy and compassion in this house and God wants to have compassion on you my friend he wants to smile upon you. He doesn't want to judge you. He doesn't want to reject you. He doesn't want to cast you aside. As a matter of fact, he thinks well of you. You just don't think well of yourself. He's casting out the hope lifeline if you would want to receive it. We have some time. If that's you, if you're not sure and you say, well, Pastor, I don't know. I need this kind of hope. I want you to... Come up to the altar real quick. Come real quick. Don't, we're not going to take much time. Please come. Come, 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 come. Come right now. I'll let you come. Come on. Stay right there. Stay right there. Hallelujah. 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 Come, come. If you need God's hope, you need God's help. You need to be rescued. You need to be healed. You need to be restored. Come. Marriage restored. People restored. Relationships restored. Come, 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 come. There's only one answer. There's only one answer, and that's Jesus. Come. Come. Now raise your hands to heaven symbol of submission and faith a symbol of submission and faith begin to cry out to God and say God give me that hope Father God I pray for these people tonight Lord I pray that supernatural blessing and restoration power on them I pray for divine healing Lord from on high I pray for the supernatural, Father God, where it doesn't work, it doesn't exist. They're confused, they're doubting. There is nothing left. There is something left in you, Father. 
And I thank you for the working power of Jesus Christ himself to set the captive free and to create something out of nothing. And where there is deadness, there's life, mercy, hope, and grace. I pray, Father God, for every relationship that exists, every relationship that is not working, every relationship that needs a change, Lord, that they would seek you and only you and they would find you faithful. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Now repeat this after me. I promise to depend on God, to seek Him, to heal me, to restore me, to bring me to a supernatural place that I can't do by myself. I need you, Jesus. I need your help, Jesus. Heal me, Jesus. Set me free, Jesus. Give me this, Jesus. I give you my life. I give you my marriage. I give you my relationship. I hand it over to you. You make it work. You do what I can't do. You do the work of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. This is a part of service. This is really the best part. It's not just hearing stories and our story and scriptures and us teaching. This is where it's at. Because I have a very important question to ask you. No getting up, no moving around. Please, respect the Spirit of God. There's a question that we ask here time and time again after every service. We ask the same question because we feel it's important to ask you, and I need to ask you tonight. The question is this. If somehow, by maybe no fault of your own, you get in your car, cross watermen, somebody sideswipes you, and you don't make it, where would you be? Would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? That's a real important question to ask. We believe that most churches don't ask it enough. And for us to assume that someone invited you here and your participation in a service is enough, we don't make that assumption. That's why we ask you this question. It's a very direct question. It's a life-changing question. We have buried many individuals here in this house. I buried a 15-year-old one day, and he was a rock star at his school. No one thought that that night that he'd lose his life in a car accident. So the question exists. Where would you be? Would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? You might say to me, well, I think I'll be in heaven. You know, throughout the whole Bible, we don't find you thinking your way to heaven. Those that think their way and those that automatically spiritually descend or ascend with their mentalities to a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ, it doesn't work that way. You might say, well, Pastor, I, I hope I'll go to heaven. Well, that's the kind of hope I was talking against. A wishy-washy, maybe, hopefully. The Bible says that that hope is not hope at all. You might say, well, I believe. Well, the Bible also says that demons believe and they're not going to heaven. So that's why this question has to exist. And you have to answer it. This is a relationship between you and God. Now, the Bible explains this question in another fashion with a real righteous guy by the name of Nicodemus. He was a teacher of the law. He was a one who spoke the scriptures, sang the scriptures. He was probably better than you and me both put together. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ, John chapter 3. And Jesus asked him the same question I'm asking you. He said to him, and I say to you, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. It blew Nicodemus' religious mind out of the water. Because in Nicodemus' mind was this question, 
how can I be born again? I thought I was good enough. I thought all my religious background, all, I thought all the religious training solidified my way to heaven. And Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, that's not the way you come in. You need to be born again. Now, Hollywood, TV, movies have displayed born again as some weirdo freaks that all they are doing is dressed in white shirts and white ties and white suits asking for money. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a God encounter with Jesus Christ. And Nicodemus was demanded by Jesus that he need to be born again. And that's the question I ask you. Well, how do you be born again? You be born again by giving God all your heart and giving God all your life, all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. All or nothing means all or nothing. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelations, he said this, if you're either hot or cold, if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's a pretty real tough statement to hear. But that's what Jesus qualifies as lukewarm. What's lukewarm? A little up, a little down, a little here, a little there. Dabbing in church, dabbing in the relationship with God, but not really taking it seriously kind of one foot in the world and one foot in the church is lukewarm. My Bible tells me that God will now vomit you in when you get up to heaven and he asks of you, what do you want from me? Now, the question demands an answer and only you can answer it. The way we do it here at The Rock is we ask you to raise your hand. In a little bit, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to say one, two, three, and I'm going to go, bam! One, two, three, bam! When I do that, you're going to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to be born again. It demands faith. Supernatural faith. So, the question is, where will you be? The answer is between you and God. He won't judge you. He won't criticize you. He won't shame you or embarrass you. If you want to raise your hand, you will be embarrassed for a mere moment for eternity's heaven. So he asked, and I asked. I'm going to ask, and I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I say three, you raise your hand. Who should raise your hand? If you're running from God instead of to God, you need to raise your hand. If you're not sure, you need to be sure. If you don't know, you need to know. If you're running from him instead of to him, one, two, ten, three, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, over here, five. Six, seven, eight. I got your hand over there. Nine. I got your hands. Are we on this side? Ten. Family room. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Anybody else? 14. Fifteen. All right. Okay. Let's give it up for 15 people. Now, all who raise their hand, grab your purse. Sweater, Bible, friend, if you need a friend, and come up to the front with me, right up here to the altar. Come right now. Everybody stand and greet them. Come. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I'll live for you alone. Every come. breath.
Everybody up here, look at me. You are making the best decision in your whole life, for your whole life. We celebrate your decision. Smile. You're not going to hell, you're going to heaven. You now have a promise that's going to be fulfilled and you have hope and confidence in someone that you can depend on. Now here at The Rock, the way we do it is we offer you a couple things. A spiritual personal friend or an SBT. Somebody that comes alongside and works out your salvation, what the Bible calls fear and trembling, won't call you. He won't do anything scary. We'll follow up and love you to life. We say here, if you give us, the SPT ministry is five weeks long. If you give us five weeks, then follow it up with one year, your life will be changed forever. That's the commitment we make you. So in the back, they're going to give you, they're going to pray for you, going to give you some free material that our senior pastors wrote. It takes about 5, 10, 15 minutes to read. Read it. Pastor Dave is right here, okay? Pastor Dave has been voted the nicest pastor of The Rock, second to Pastor Dan, okay? He's a really, really, really cool guy, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and follow him. And he's going to now lead you in a prayer and give you some material. Give it up to the Lord.